My name is Lucy, as you heard, and I'm rector of St James's Church in Piccadilly. So it's right by Piccadilly Circus, which is exactly as you imagine it. And I live right there, right by the church. And uh, I was just telling somebody this morning that uh, I, woke, I was woken up at half past six this morning by one of the guys who uh, sleeps on the street just outside um, our church yelling, uh, yelling really loudly at about half past six this morning. And it made me think about what I wanted to talk to you about today, which is our experience at St. James's, which is essentially simply a parish church. It's a geographical area right by Piccadilly Circus. But what we, uh, how we experience our guests, and that's what we say they are who are homeless, is that we keep our church open every day from eight o'clock until, uh, until the evening. And very often uh, the pews on one side of our church are full of people sleeping uh, during the day. And we run all the projects that you're running, a night shelter, and we have a breakfast as well. But I'm not going to talk about the projects today, because uh, you can ask me about those afterwards. I want to talk about something else, which is what I'm reaching for as a distinctive Christian response to the issue of homelessness, which is essentially about people. Yesterday, I sat next to, I'll call him Michael, for lunch. He sleeps on the streets and in the pews of our church regularly. We all know him. Sometimes he's able to talk to us. Other times he's high. Other times he's raging. Other times he's really low. In the summer, he often bowls up to people sitting outside the local restaurants in Piccadilly and asks them for money for his drugs, which he over the years has periodically come off and gone back on again. Yesterday, we were laughing together about the first time that he and I met. It was about six years ago, and it was on Christmas Day. We were sitting in the church on that occasion too, having lunch. We were talking about where we were born, and he was very pleased that he turned out to be a couple of years younger than me. I was born in Salisbury in Wiltshire. He was born in Harare in Zimbabwe. I asked him what Harare was like, expecting him to say something brief about the weather, or the people, or the size. He looked thoughtful and then said rather grandly with a knowledgeable nod, Harare has an undulating topography. <laughs> we really laughed together and decided he had a future in the tourist industry. That answer struck me, but it also taught me about him and shattered any preconceptions I had about him as a, quotes, homeless man. He's funny, he's creative, He's thoughtful and intelligent. He's also lost. He's furious. He's stuck. He's addicted to substances that it seems to me are slowly killing him. Sometimes when I see him, I feel that over these years that I've known him, I'm watching him die. I am rather helplessly watching him die. And it reminds me of Good Friday. So much of our public conversations about homelessness are on the level of policy parameters, paid posts for key workers, outreach workers, resettlement workers, and it's vital work, it's practical work, it's organised and effective, and it helps move the dial on what's evidently a growing population of people who live outside. What is a Christian response to homelessness? I want to reach for some principles that I find rooted in the teaching of Christ, who famously, unlike the foxes and the birds, had nowhere to lay his head. Although his itinerant life was lived in the balmy climate of the Galilean hills, relying on the financial support of his women disciples and staying in the homes of both friends and strangers, life in midwinter London is pretty different. And our church buildings, thank God, are often magnets for people in need of shelter or warmth or kindness. And so in search of a Christian blueprint, I want to talk about the story Jesus told in relation to a set of questions he was asked. Jesus is teaching the crowd to love their neighbor. So who is that, he is asked. And in reply, he tells the story of the man who was beaten up and left by the side of the road. A few people hurried past, including some religious types. And then one stopped, an enemy, a sworn opponent, 
a Samaritan, a hostile neighbour to Jesus' largely Jewish audience. When Martin Luther King preached on this story, he said that most of us, when we listen to it, identify with the people walking past. Our instinctive reaction is therefore to ask ourselves, what will happen to me if I stop? Do you recognise that response? What will happen to me if I stop, if I talk, if I engage? There might be no end to this. He might ask me for money and I wouldn't know what to say. He might be angry with me. Do I have to offer him a room in my house? Does he have to come and live with me? How would I ever get him to leave? We go from A to Z in a flash. We've spent 10 years trying to get rid of a person in our spare room. And a simple hello opens up a world of what seems like unbounded possibilities that in the end keeps us away from each other. Because we're asking the question, what will happen to me if I help? But Martin Luther King's question was different. He asked his congregation to ask, not what will happen to me if I stop, but what will happen to him if I don't? And I'd like to take it even further for this talk. Jesus' story of the man by the side of the road and all those people's different reactions to him is so powerful because it's an everyday, ordinary story. And the genius of Jesus' parables is that I am, you are, every character in that story. So turn it round. What is the part of you that is bleeding and left for dead at the side of the road? What is the part of you that is bleeding that the more efficient, breezy, functioning part of you hurries past? And what are the violent parts of you that want to crush and destroy the bits you don't like? The violent tendencies that lead you to self-sabotage, keep you stuck, keep you making bad decisions. These are the connections that Christ asks us to make in that amazing parable. Because in inhabiting that story, Jesus teaches us the kind of compassion that's his and that often leads us in surprising directions. In Greek, the word is compassion that's deep in our gut. In, in Greek, it has the sense of in your bowels. The kind of compassion that breaks your heart. If we dare to pray for that kind of compassion, rooted in our own experience of ourselves, then it has surprising outcomes. I want to suggest this to you tonight because it doesn't just make us what's known in the jargon as non-interventionist. It doesn't lead us to a well-meaning, head-on-the-side acceptance of whatever we're, set, whatever we're told. That can, in turn, abandon that other person deeper into their own addiction and distress. Because when we get to know those side-of-the-road parts of ourselves, where we're most vulnerable, where we're ashamed, then we know too that it isn't always the right thing to do simply to accept the story that we tell. Sometimes, as scripture warns us, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We know that. And sometimes we know we need other people not to abandon us, but to confront us, although it may make us angry at the time. This Christ-shaped compassion, prayed for, deepened, cultivated, nurtures, makes us strong, makes us joyful, makes us broken-hearted, makes us determined not passive or quietist. And what's more, it helps us resist what we might call our pastoral lust, which drives us sometimes harmfully to try to sort people out, tell them what they need, judge them. The kind of compassion I'm talking about helps us resist two dangers, one of passivity, and one of overactivity. But equally, that kind of compassion is stubbornly committed to keeping the agency and responsibility of another person with them, not taking it away. If the scriptural basis then for a distinctive Christian response is Jesus's parables and those gospel accounts of that visceral compassion, often fueled by anger 
at any hint of sanctimoniousness or piety, if the scriptural basis for our response is that, then our contemporary response as Christians rooted, is rooted in our vision of a just and peaceful and beautiful future which we experience every time we celebrate communion. Whenever I celebrate communion, I think it is a forward-looking sacrament, not a memorial service. The communion service, the Eucharist, reveals a vision of God's future where everyone is welcome and everyone is fed. At that altar, there is no murmur of enslavement or injustice. We rehearse that new future when we share bread and wine. We practice it, we repeat it, we nurture our trust in the promise that it's coming. And it gives us then a liturgical blueprint for a church response to homelessness that's rooted in confession and forgiveness, first of all of ourselves. That puts at the center of our response a broken-hearted Christ, the night before he died, breaking bread at his, as his own body. And it offers to each person, homeless or not, the invitation to be changed, to make different decisions, to be transformed. So our response to someone like Michael, who I mentioned at the beginning, is to keep issuing that invitation to a new future that we learn in the Eucharist. Relentlessly reissue it again and again, which will mean challenge as well as acceptance if we've inhabited the story of the Good Samaritan properly. At the same time, if it's our vocation to accompany him to his death, then our Eucharistic identity will require of us that we stay connected, even to the night before he dies, in the conviction that we share the humanity that Christ lived. I simply don't believe that deep down anyone chooses to be homeless, whatever an individual might say on the day. The immense suffering that this unanchored living causes is carved into the freezing hands and messed up feet that come with a winter on the streets, as vividly as the wounds from the nails at crucifixion. It's a kind of torture to be so close to other people who seem to have got it together when you've slipped beneath the waves. So a church response to homelessness, whatever projects we run or meals we cook, or shelters we host, or individual conversations we have, we're asked to be rooted in surprisingly bracing compassion. And so at its base, our vocation as Christians, I want to suggest to you tonight, is to stay, to look into each other's eyes, and to let Michael and others know that we somehow have the courage to harrow his hell with him. Thank you.